Good morning, Keel Street. We're here and we're missing you. Let's read from God's word together. From the book of Job. Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Accept instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. So let us come to him and, and worship him for the good he is to us.
more than enough. You take care of your servants. You've made us a community where there's no need for poverty because we look out for each other. Because we don't consider our things our own anymore, but are ready to share. Lord, make us people ready to share, ready to do good, ready to let go of things for the sake of people. Lord, we just want to thank you for the fact that we can have confidence, even in times like this, that you will take care of us. Lord, I know there's a lot of uncertainty. People are worried about their jobs. They're worried about how their jobs are changing. And I ask that you would remind us how much more than enough you are. In Jesus' name. Your heart and lead me in your love to the
is worthy. He is worthy of us yielding ourselves to him, making our life decisions based on what we feel he wants us to do, being people who live out his love to those around us. To fill us with all of the things we need, the power, the love, the sound mind, the self-control, the fruit of his spirit's presence within us. Jesus, you're all this heart is living. 
back, uh, I think, <laughs> kind of, sort of. Uh, I want to thank Joel and, uh, and Bill for filling in for me for the past couple of weeks. Usually when I go away, I, I just uh, let people preach whatever message they want to preach, uh, whatever message the Lord puts on their hearts, but, but I felt in this present series that, that it was important that we stay in the series and continue um, in the series while I was away. And just to remind you of what our present series is about, it's basically comprised of two separate but complementary themes. First, we have the theme of unity and diversity. You know, we remember the ideal image of the church worshiping Christ in Revelation. John declares, there before me was a great multitude that, that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne. And before the Lamb, and they were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands, and they were crying out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You know, this is the outcome of God's plan. This is the desire of God for his creation. To be together, to be to united, be united, regardless of, of race or nationality or culture or language. In Christ we are one. That, that, that's, that's the end goal. In Christ we're also equal. As Paul put it in Galatians, in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, the big picture uh, of, of the story of the Bible is this. We were created in the image of God. We were created equal. We were created to be one family, one people, carrying out the will and the mandate of our creator to represent him and to flourish. But when sin entered the world, so did pride and selfishness. And as a result, so did suffering and injustice. And since sin entered the world, Yahweh has been working to restore what our rebellion ruined. And the restoration finds its foundation in the promise and the coming of Christ. Through his sacrifice and his victory over sin and death and and the powers that seek to continue the reign of chaos and destruction in our present age, the process of recreation has begun. The church is to be the beachhead where God's plan of re recreation is made manifest and, and moves forward through the power and the work of God's Spirit as He transforms us and as He, as he reunites us until that time when he returns, when God's work of recreation will be complete. So we see that in Christ we are already children of God through faith, and we are moving towards a day when every tribe, nation, language, and people will be united under the Lordship of Christ. There will be no more tears, and there will be no more sorrow, no more suffering or pain. In other words, there will be no more inequity or injustice. You know, that's the big picture. Th this is the vision we need to keep before us as we seek to be God's agents of recreation. And this brings us to the second theme of our series, which, which is our call. As Christians, we are called to be agents of justice. Agents of justice and fairness and equity. We're, we're called to honor God's image in all people and to help them flourish. First and foremost, by preaching the gospel, but also by loving them and caring for them as Christ does. Actually, it goes even further than that. It's richer than that. It's more nuanced than that. Most of you will remember Jesus' parable about the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. You know, we're told 
when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Here we have this picture of Christ's return and the judgment that will follow. The context tells us that the judgment pictured in this parable is Jesus' judgment on God's people. The church is the focus of of this judgment scene. And what is the criteria by which Jesus will judge the church? It's how we either help or hinder the poor, the hungry, the naked, the sick, the stranger. You know, stranger includes refugees, persons from another culture, race or place. And finally, those who are in prison, whether that's a a literal prison or a figurative prison. You know, these are the weak, the forgotten, the marginalized, the oppressed. What we do with those who need help, who need hope, who need to be valued is important. In fact, it is so much more important than our Christ, to our Christian faith and witness than any of us fully realizes or understands. You know, in this parable, Jesus is telling the church that we will be judged by our attitude towards issues of, of poverty and social justice. But it goes even further. <laughs> And this is mind-blowing and shocking and downright humbling when you think about it. Jesus continues, Then the king will say to those on his right, the, the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or, or needing clothes and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. There's a truth here that we must acknowledge. Jesus as as son of God, Jesus as Yahweh in the flesh, as Messiah king, so identifies with the victims of injustice that he says that whatever we do for some of the least of these, we are actually doing it for him. Which also means that as this parable progresses, if we refuse to seek to do acts of justice and equality, we are refusing Christ. And we're actually showing that we have no part of him and, and, and have not participated in his saving grace. Jesus says the goats that consider themselves saved will go away to eternal punishment. Couldn't think of another way to say it that made it sound any better, sorry. Doesn't that shake you up a bit? It should, it does me. It's a rather startling wake-up call. But in another way, it shouldn't surprise us at all because because God is always identified with the oppressed and he's always expected his people to do the same. Please turn with me to Isaiah 58. As you turn there, let me give you a bit of background. Isaiah 58 has strong ties to the beginning of Isaiah in which Yahweh declares, when you come to appear before me, Who has asked this of you? This trampling of my courts. Ouch. Yahweh is basically saying, whatever you're doing in the temple here, I didn't ask you to do it. It's not what you're doing. You're you're trampling on my courts here. You're taking up space. He sees his people as unwelcome guests in his own home. 
as door-to-door salesmen selling what he isn't buying. He sees them as guests who stay way too long, who, who eat way too much, and who are way too loud. There's no pleasure in their presence. There's no real fellowship. There's no real connection. Just, just annoyance. In fact, he continues, Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. You know, clearly there's something wrong between God and his people. What could it be? Well, obviously there, there's something in the way they're relating in, to and, and approaching God. But it doesn't seem to be in their lack of spiritual interest. You know, they're doing all the religious stuff. In fact, in verse 15, we see a rather concerted effort on their part. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. They offer many prayers. They they pray expressively. They're seeking God, but, but God's not listening. They seem to be trying to get an answer from God excuse me, an answer from God, but they're just spinning their wheels because God is ghosting them. He he isn't listening. We have all probably felt this at one time or another, this situation, this but this statement isn't based on our feelings. It's a testimony of God Himself. This is a reality. God wasn't, in fact, listening. Didn't just feel like he wasn't listening. He actually wasn't listening. That's scary. So so it seems to be a lot of religious activity happening, but nothing that God seems particularly moved by. Is Yahweh being difficult? Is he distracted? Is he playing games with them? God doesn't do that. Yahweh tells them exactly what the problem is. Their hands were full of blood. So, so the problem isn't that they aren't praying enough or they aren't paying enough attention to God. It's that their faith has done nothing to change, that they way, change the way they treat one another. Yahweh's advice is this. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Yahweh wasn't listening to them because they weren't interested in social justice. Does that surprise you? Has that been on your radar throughout your Christian walk? How important social justice is? He wasn't listening to them because they weren't interested In social justice, God expects our relationship with him to change the way we relate to one another, especially in the way we relate to those who are experiencing injustice and oppression and poverty and those who are most vulnerable and at risk. The overall principle is much more nuanced than I've just stated here, but this is a good starting point. We come to a similar circumstance in Isaiah 58. Beginning with verse 1, we read, Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. Let's stop there for a moment. The prophet is instructed to stop everything and get their attention, get the people's attention. He's to shout at the top of his voice like a trumpet. You know, this is a reference to the shofar, a a musical instrument made from a, a ram's horn that was used to gain community-wide attention. You know, think of it as a fire alarm or the emergency broadcasting system. It, it's a piercing blast that communicates the stopping of all activity in order to give your undivided attention to what the announcement is going to be. And, and the message is one that points to their rebellion and their sin. This is Yahweh blowing the whistle and telling everyone to get out of the pool. Continue on with verse 2. For day after day, they seek me out. 
They seem eager to know my ways. As if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and they seem eager for God to come near them. Let's stop there. You kind of have to wonder what, what he's angry at here, don't you? You know, the, the two instances of the word seem in this verse have been supplied by the translators of the NIV. They're not in the Hebrew text. And translators are, are trying to help us understand, you know, that there's something amiss. They're, they're trying to help us along in, in understanding because it, it, it seems, verse 2, is quite a positive statement here. But it's also a bit of a misleading situation that it gives us here because it suggests that the people aren't being sincere. But there's nothing in the text here that suggests that they're being insincere in their worship. Nothing. You know, the, the translators are helping, but maybe they make us read a little bit more into it than, than is really there. They seek Yahweh out day after day. They're eager to know his ways. His ways, excuse me. They're, they're eager to know his word, his will. They ask for just decisions. And they're eager for God to come near to them. That's better than I am most days. There's nothing in these verses that suggests that they aren't sincerely seeking to worship Yahweh and, and obey his commands. They're not running after other gods. They care about worshiping God. They care about God's word and obeying his will. But then we have a clue. As if they were a nation that does what is right. In other words, they look like a nation that does what's right. But there's something amiss. They aren't a nation that does what's right. Then we have verse 3. Verse 3 is key to understanding what's going on here. This is Israel speaking back to God here. Why have we fasted, they say? And you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? In verse 3, the subject of fasting is introduced and carried on throughout the rest of the chapter as a, as a framework for what is being said until verses 13 and 14 where the topic switched to Sabbath keeping. In theory, fasting and Sabbath keeping are both involved in stopping normal activity to focus on the spiritual. That's the way it's supposed to be. You know, the, the hunger that fasting produces is supposed to remind us that, that, as God's people, that we do not live by bread alone. It's to remind us that our ultimate hunger should be for God. You know, the Sabbath reminds us that our prosperity and well-being in life does not come from the work of our hands. Ultimately, it comes from our relationship with Yahweh. So both fasting and Sabbath keeping are about our relationship with God. But verse 3 tells us that God's people are fasting to get God's attention and manipulate him into doing what they want him to do. This is God's people worshiping Yahweh with a pagan paradigm. It's pagan thinking that we need to earn an audience with God. It's pagan thinking that we need to make a sacrifice to get his attention. It's not how you approach Yahweh. It makes fasting about ourselves, not God. In verse 3, they're saying, you know, we've done our part, Lord. Now it's time for you to do yours. We're paying attention to you. Why aren't you paying attention to us? We showed up. Why aren't you showing up? To their way of thinking, they're doing all the right religious stuff. They're sincere and motivated, and they're involved, and they're doing right things. And I'm sure that they want the things that they want God to do are things that are important. And they don't see their hypocrisy. He always responses beginning at the end of, of verse 3. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. 
Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Basically, God's saying is, you're doing it all wrong and I'm not listening. You take a day and you put on sackcloth and ashes. You humble yourself, kind of, sort of. <laughs> on some kind of superficial level. You deny yourself, but you deny yourself to get something in return. Your seeking of me has not affected how you treat other people. If anything, your religious effort has made you grumpier and more oppressive to others. It has made you more selfish and self-centered. You know, the grace that you have received in Yahweh has not been extended to others. Picking things up in verse 6, Yahweh says, this is the kind of fasting I'm looking for. You know, this is the kind of religious activity that gets my attention. This is the kind of religious behavior I want from my people. To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Now, as you think about this verse, Jesus' words in Matthew 25 should, should be ringing in your ears. Jesus identifies with the hungry and the thirsty, the sick and the stranger, the naked and the prisoner. And that's nothing new when it comes to Yahweh and his attitude. In Proverbs 14, 31, we read, Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Proverbs 19, we read, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. There is this fundamental connection that is made between real faith that pleases Yahweh and social justice. Notice the progression in verse 6 regarding the word yoke. You know, what's a yoke? I was going to make a pun there, but I'm not going to. What's a yoke? In this context, it's whatever is oppressive. It's, it's the yoke of oppression. It's the heavy burdens that we bear in life that, that keep us from flourishing. Those burdens that others place upon us keep us down. Not, notice the progression. We're not only to untie the cords of the yoke, we're to break every yoke, every yoke. In other words, we're not only to re release individuals from oppression, we're to remove the systems of oppression as well. Yahweh wants fairness and equality of all people. He, he wants all people to be equally valued and nurtured. Perhaps this might be a, a good time to talk a little bit about biblical justice. Because social justice means different things to different people. So what is biblical justice? mean? What do we mean by, by justice in the Bible? Behind the concept of justice is the rich concept of shalom. We talked about shalom when we were in the Fruits of the Spirit series. And shalom is, is usually translated as peace, but it's so much more than that. So much richer than that. So much deeper than that. It speaks of a sense of mutual well-being. Mutual, across the whole culture, the whole world, the whole society. It speaks of a state of human flourishing and joy that everyone participates in. One commentator describes it as a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts are faithfully employed, all under the arc of God's love. Shalom is the way things ought to be. Old Testament scholar Bruce Walke, Walke uh, puts all the teaching on righteousness in the book of Proverbs into a concise and, and practical principle. He, this, is, this is important. He says, the righteous are willing to disadvantage themselves to advantage the community. 
The wicked are willing to disadvantage the community to advantage themselves. So, so the idea of a biblical justice is this image of shalom, shalom of, of universal human flourishing through our faith in God that motivates us to understand that we're, we're all interrelated and we're all interconnected. What this means is that your stuff is not just your stuff. It's to be used to promote shalom because it's ultimately a gift from God. You know, I, I want you to think about cancer for a moment. Just probably think about it more than you need to anyway, but... You know, what is cancer? It's a group of rogue cells that, that make it their goal to take the body's resources and do everything it can to serve its own interests and growth to the point of bringing complete destruction and death ultimately to the body as a whole. Injustice is societal cancer. It is the flourishing of rogue cells at the expense of, of everyone else. A healthy body, on the other hand, works together. All the very systems do their things and make their contributions to ensure that everything is healthy. Strong and functioning well. That, that's, that's what a healthy body is. This is what justice is. It's an attitude of contributing to the whole so that every part flourishes. The righteous are willing to disadvantage themselves to advantage the community. The wicked are willing to disadvantage the community to advantage themselves. You know, you need to write that down. Go ahead, do it. Every time you read through your Old Testament and come to the word righteous or the word wicked, plug this definition in and see how it changes your view of worship and, and how it changes your view of, of how God wants his people to function in this world. Great devotional exercise. Let's move on to verse 7. Because it reinforces this idea. Again, speaking about the kind of fasting that, that God's response responds to and delights in. He says, Is it not to share your food with the hungry? And, and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them. And to not turn away from your own flesh and blood. And there's Hebrew parallelism going on here. And I'm going to bring Bill on now and he's going to explain what that is. It's, it's not that difficult. You'll see it in a second here. The same truth is stated twice in a slightly different way to bring out a greater understanding of, of the principle that's being taught. So the word hungry in the first part of the verse is parallel to naked in the second part. You know, that's not too difficult for us to see the connection there, right? You know, but then we have the poor wanderer in the first half of the verse, which is parable or parallel to your own flesh and blood. That's significant. Who is a poor wanderer? Someone not like you. Someone in need. Someone from another race. Someone from another culture. They are refugees. The oppressed. Those under the yoke of injustice. And guess what? We are to see the poor wanderer as our own flesh and blood. In the context of biblical culture, this is huge. Family was everything. Your survival, your identity, your well-being was all tied up in family. Family was what always came first. You know, and it's a good thing in the sense of, of the support in the community that it creates for the family and within the family. It was necessary to survive in that culture. But the downside is that it can create a kind of us and them attitude as well. Our family, our people, our tribe are what are ultimately important. And we'll do what we can to make sure that our family, our people, our tribe prospers, even if it means others don't. But what Yahweh is saying here is he's saying that we're all family. We're all each other's flesh and blood doesn't get more intimate than that in the description of family, does it? 
The poor wanderer isn't a stranger. They are our own flesh and blood. Now let me ask you a question. Is there any sacrifice that you wouldn't make for the well-being of your family? You will do things for your family willingly, out of, out of love and concern, no matter how much time and effort and resources that it takes, right? And you'll do it gladly because they're your family, and you're not happy if they're not happy. It's basically the definition of a parent. If your kids aren't happy, you're not happy. If your family suffers, you suffer. So you will do everything you can to fix whatever is broken, whatever the cause of that suffering may be. That is what our attitude should be to those who are oppressed, those who are poor and hungry and naked, th those who are in prison, those who have yokes that need to be broken. They are our flesh and blood. Tim Keller, commenting on this passage, says, a deep social conscience and a life poured out in deeds of service to others, especially to the poor, is the inevitable sign of real faith and a real connection with God. That's what's going on here. This is what Isaiah 58 is all about. It's, a, it's, it's not about doing something extra to get God's approval finally. It's about understanding that we are living in such a way that we are truly connected to God. We have a legitimate, flourishing relationship with Him. Tim Keller goes on to say, justice is the grand symptom of faith. I love that. Justice is the grand symptom of faith. You know, it is the desire for justice that best shows the reality of our faith. It's not our worship. It's not our prayers. It's not our fasting or our desire to know and follow God's word and will. God's people were doing all of these things. But they didn't mean anything to Yahweh because they didn't care about justice. Going back to Isaiah 1. All their religious devotion was nothing more than a trampling on temple grounds. Yahweh declared, stop bringing, my, stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Now, does, does this mean that, that worship and prayer and reading and obeying God's word doesn't matter to God? Of course not. All of these things are important. But the point is, they're only important in the right context. They're only useful to us and pleasing to God in the right context. They're only important if you don't use them to manipulate God and to, to make him do what you want him to do. It's only helpful when these things aren't about you getting what you want from God but they're about you being humbled before God and asking him what he wants of you because you love him. That's the right context. In the context of your, of your worship and your dedication, these things are extremely important, but it, only in the proper context. And in the proper context, they bring change to your heart and they bring you closer to God and they will make you a people who care about justice. So, so don't walk away from the sermon today thinking the Israelites prayed and sacrificed and worshipped and studied and obeyed God's word, but that wasn't enough to please God. You know, there was one more thing they had to add to their religious checklist. And that would be completely missing the point of this passage and, and actually taking the wrong understanding from this, the completely opposite understanding of this passage away. It's not that he just wants us to add social justice to our list of things that we do for him in order for him to listen to us, in order for us to get what we want from him. That's not what we're talking about here. That's not the kind of religion we're talking about. That's not what God is interested in. It's about relationship with God. It's about seeking God's will instead of focusing on our own will. It's about living and loving and transforming relationship where we become like Christ by spending time with him so that we can care about the things that he cares about 
and we can be more like him as we live in this world. You know, listen to the promise of God beginning in verse 8 of Isaiah 58. I'm not going to, I'm just going to read it because it's a beautiful thing. Then your light will break forth a- after the proper kind of, of fasting. Then, then your light will break forth like the dawn. And your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If, if you do away with the yokes of oppression, with the pointing fingers, the malicious talk, if you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise on the darkness and, and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always and he will satisfy your needs as the sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. He, he, he will be like a, a well-watered garden, like a spring whose water never fails. You, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and, and will rise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls and restorer of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and, and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, if you want to spend time with him rather than put an hour in at church, then you will find joy in the Lord. I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It's him underlining, I've just signed the contract here. What a promise, what what, what an invitation. Yahweh isn't saying, if you care for the poor and the oppressed, I will show up when you want me to. No, 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 no. He's saying, if you start to see the world through my eyes, if you care about the things I care about, if you're being an agent of shalom because of your passion in life and because you know me and you know my heart and you know how much I love and identify with everyone who experiences injustice, then you will truly know and experience new life in me. Why did Jesus identify with the least of these? Why did he say that whatever you do for them, you're doing for me? It's because if you know him, if you want to please him, you will care about what he cares about. It's interesting that the sheep in the parable don't actually know that they're serving Christ when they're doing all of these things. They didn't know it. They, they, they said, you know, when, when did we do these things for you, Lord? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't remember doing these things for you. They just simply did it because they knew the king, because they knew it would please the king. They simply did it because their relationship with Christ and their understanding of grace and the prompting of the Holy Spirit transformed them and it gave them the capacity and the desire to care to be agents of shalom, to to be a beachhead of transformation through being the body of Christ. As we come to the Lord's table, I, I want you to think about what God has done for us through Christ. Only Christianity shows us how far God is willing to identify with the poor and the oppressed. Only Christianity does that. You know, think about it. Jesus was a product of injustice. Every part of Jesus' trial was a miscarriage of justice. Joan Terrell, uh, an African-American woman who grew up bitter because of of injustice she experienced growing up black in in the U.S. She she was in a, a graduate course where they were going through the teachings of Christianity. 
And, and they were talking about the cross. She writes, I suddenly began to realize that Jesus Christ did not just suffer for us, he suffered with us. Suddenly, an African-American woman realized that Jesus Christ had been lynched by a corrupt justice system. And Jesus Christ knew what it was like to be under the lash. John Stott wrote, In a world of injustice, I could never believe in God without the cross. Because in a world of injustice, how could I believe in a God who's immune from it? God's grace means that Jesus was treated unjustly so that you could be saved from God's justice. He did it so that, so that you could experience Christian privilege, if you want to put it that way. He did it so that you, we could have a relationship with him and we could begin a journey of shalom. In this time around the table, Ask yourself, have I been acting more like a sheep or a goat? Is, is, my, is my worship, is my, is my Bible study, is my prayer time, is, is my acts of service more about pleasing God so I can get things from Him or more about just loving God and wanting to be His instrument in this world? Huge question to ask. And it's not a black and white question because we flip-flop all the time. But do business at the table and ask God for his forgiveness because he will give it. Ask him to listen to your cries for help and he will give them. He will answer them. Ask for strength to be better at caring like he cares and he will help you with that as well. Amen. Thank you, Grant. As we come to the table, we're, we're going to sing a song that, that, that mixes a number of images. The baptism of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, and our own baptism, our own new life in a new family. And so let's let us celebrate this. It is transforming to us to be part of this family, agents of this shalom, simply because that's what our Father is like. This is my revelation, Christ Jesus crucified. Salvation through repentance at the cross on which he died. Now hear my absolution, forgiveness for my sin.
Your kingdom knows no end. Your praise goes on forever. And on and on again. No power can stand against you. No curse assault your throne. No one can steal your glory. For it is yours alone. I stand to sing your praises. I stand to testify. 